Well, it's good to see everyone here this evening. If you'll turn your Bibles to Revelation chapter 11, we will continue in our study of that text and bring ourselves to the end of the first half of the book. The book kind of naturally divides itself between chapters 11 and 12. Uh, We're going to see here this evening the end of this uh, series of visions. It started with uh, seven seals and then became seven trumpets. And as these uh, seven trumpets end, we find kind of a grand uh, climax to the book. And then as we start chapter 12, we're going to see the very same message, just repeated in different language, language that is a little bit more intense. And so John's going to take us through the picture again, but in a little bit more descriptive way now that we've got the idea. So uh, our basic approach has been that John is not writing a calendar of ancient history, This is not a progression or a sequence or a chronology of things. John is describing over and over again the same scene, the scene of victory for God's people and destruction of their enemies and how God is going to rescue his people from the oppression of unbelievers. Uh, The particular form that that oppression is taking in the first century, we have suggested, is the emperor cult in which the Roman emperor's were more and more insistent on being treated and thought of as divine. We're going to see some of that in our text this evening. Of course, no Christian could conscientiously go along with that, and that was going to make difficulty for the Christians, as we have seen historical evidence to that uh, effect as we've studied already. So John is telling us about this conflict, but in, you know, uh, a dozen or so different ways. And yet the end of the story is always the same and the victory is always there. But tonight we're going to see the climax of John's telling of this in the first half of the book. So in chapter 11, we're going to pick up with verse 7. Remember that uh, there was this picture of the temple of God that was measured so that it would be protected. The outer court was given to be trodden underfoot by the Gentiles, that is the unbelievers, for 42 months which turns out to be 1,260 days or three and a half years, which is symbolic in apocalyptic literature of a time of oppression, persecution, and hardship for the people of God. And we note also uh, in the introductory part of the chapter here that there were two witnesses in verse 3. And we've suggested that they symbolize the church as they hold out the gospel to a wicked and perverse world, that they are testifying about the truth of Jesus Christ. And we're going to see that uh, they're going to be mistreated for their testimony, and yet ultimately they are going to have the victory. And so let's pick up in verse 7. When they, that is the two witnesses, the symbol of God's people here, have finished their testimony... Uh, finished not in the sense that they preached all there would be preached and no more else would ever be preached. John is not talking here about the end of time when preaching will someday come to a stop. He means it more in the sense that they had preached all that needed to be preached to their generation, that the gospel had been sufficiently proclaimed that those who did not believe it had heard it, and they knew better. Uh, We've seen that over and over again in the book, that God has been unleashing his power against this wicked empire to try to get them to repent. But we saw in chapter 9, at the end of the chapter, that they would not repent. They did not repent of the works of their hands. And so the next message was, no more warnings, no more patience. God is going to destroy this wicked empire, and uh, it's going to come very, very soon. And so their preaching is along that same line. It is that they have preached enough to establish the truth and for people to have heard it. Paul says in several places in his writings, Romans 15, for example, uh, that uh, he has preached the gospel as far as Illyricum, and through him the message has been fully preached. And yet you read Paul later on, talking about plans to go here or there. It doesn't mean that he had preached to everyone or to every place. Uh, 
but that he had preached enough that the message had gotten out. He says the same thing uh, in Colossians. And at the end of his life, in 2 Timothy 4.17, that through me the, the message might be fully proclaimed. And that's the sense here, that these people had had enough warning. They had heard the message, they should have known what they were doing, and yet they were obstinate. And so when they have finished their testimony, the beast that comes up out of the abyss will make war with them. This is the first time we've seen uh, anything that is called a beast in the book. And he is kind of a preview of what we're going to see in chapter 13. And so again, this is not a chronology or a sequence. It is the same picture overlapping at times. We're going to see more of this later on. But the beast is a representation of an evil power that persecutes the church. And the fact is that he comes up out of the abyss, and that symbolizes that he comes from an evil place, because the abyss in the Bible is the abode of evil spirits, and ultimately the abode of the devil himself. And so he is an evil being. And he is... uh he comes up out of the abyss to afflict the earth and especially the people of God. Uh, if you would go to Daniel chapter 7, because even though I think Daniel is talking about uh, a little bit different situation, the language there is very, very similar. Uh, what Daniel saw was going to happen from his day. Daniel 7.21, I kept looking And that horn, speaking of a small horn uh, that he had seen, was waging war with the saints and overpowering them until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was passed in favor of the saints of the Highest One and the time arrived when the saints took possession of the kingdom. That is exactly the scenario that we're going to see here in Revelation chapter 11 that the saints are going to be mistreated by an evil, oppressive power, but in the end, theirs will be the kingdom. So back here in Revelation chapter uh, 11, therefore, we have this oppressive force, which is Rome and its emperor cult, ultimately, depicted as a beast that comes out of the abyss to make war with God's people. And you'll notice it says that he... Uh, and and to overcome them and to kill them. I think that's kind of John's way of saying uh, this is going to be real. This is going to be a real hardship, a real persecution. People are going to die. There are going to be difficulties. Uh, There is going to be real suffering that goes on. And so this is not just some kind of figurative language for... um, you know, hardship or misery in general, it's going to be harsh, and it will even appear at one point that evil has won. His job here, or his purpose at least, is to kill them and to overcome them. That's, uh, that is to, overkill, uh, to overcome the two witnesses that represent God's people. And it says in verse 8, their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which mystically is called Sodom and Egypt. So not only is it going to be a real persecution, but it's going to be a time of apparent victory for evil. There's going to be a time when it appears that God's people have lost. And their dead bodies lying out in the street is, of course, in the ancient world, a way of treating somebody with contempt, just like you would let garbage lie out in the street To let a human body lie out in the street is simply a way of saying that that's what we think you are. Now again, John's not talking about a a historical event. There's no need to go looking through Roman history to see if there were any time when the bodies of Christians were left out in the streets. It's not what John's talking about. He's saying that Christians are going to be treated as the, uh, the scum of the earth. They're going to be the objects of everybody's contempt and hatred. And, of course, we're suggesting that all of this is symbolic of the struggle of the early Christians against the emperor cult. And if this treatment rings a bell, uh, that we've seen this before, well, perhaps it should. In John chapter 15, as Jesus was trying to prepare his disciples uh, 
for life without Him. He said in verse 18, If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. Notice that for just a second. I chose you out of the world. Back in uh, chapter 7, we saw this great number, the 144,000 in verse 4. 144,000 sealed from every tribe, and then there are also the people that are the great multitude in verse 9. A great multitude from every nation and tribe and people and tongue. That's the people of Jesus, God's people in Christ. I chose you out of the world because of this the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. That's exactly what's going on here in chapter 11. Dead bodies lying in the street. Uh, being treated, as it were, like garbage. The body of Jesus being hung on a cross comes to mind, treated uh, as nothing. And notice here, hung uh, or laid in the street for three and a half days. No early Christian would have read that without thinking that Jesus, of course, was in the tomb for three days. There is a similarity there that cannot be missed. So they're going to be treated exactly the way that their Lord was treated, And remember, there was a time for three days that the Jewish leaders thought that they had gotten rid of Christ or Jesus. And we've killed him. He's in his tomb. We're done with him. We'll never hear from him again. And three days later, the story was going around that he wasn't dead. Well, this is exactly what's going on here, that they're going to be treated just like their master was treated. Now, this verse is of particular importance. significance because of the information it gives. And those who take a Jerusalem interpretation of the book of Revelation uh, usually like to come to this verse and say, how can this not be Jerusalem? It says here that uh, these two witnesses, that their dead bodies would lie in the street of the great city where their Lord was crucified. Now, where was Jesus crucified? Well, it was in Jerusalem. So how can this not be about Jerusalem? How can this be about Rome with a verse like that? And the argument goes on to say that we know that Christians were persecuted in Jerusalem. Read the book of Acts, the early chapters up through chapter 8, and then the latter chapters after Paul gets arrested in Jerusalem. It's clear that Jerusalem was a place of hardship for Christians. And as if to seal the deal, There are places in the Old Testament where you hear God referring to Jerusalem with this kind of language, especially Sodom. Uh, Isaiah begins his preaching in Isaiah chapter 1 saying, Listen to me, O you inhabitants of Sodom. And he's talking to the people of Jerusalem when he says that. Same with Jeremiah and Ezekiel. So based on these considerations, it is often suggested this has to mean that the book is about Jerusalem, and that the city that is oppressing the Christians is Jerusalem. Well, let me suggest to you that that might be a hasty conclusion. Every place else in the book of Revelation where we are told about the city, where that phrase is used, it is a reference to the place that is called Babylon, which is what the Jews and the early Christians called Rome. And it certainly would seem odd that the word or the phrase refers to Rome, the new Babylon, every place in the book except for one verse in chapter 11 where it would refer to Jerusalem. That that would certainly seem odd. But there's another clue here. Notice that this city is not only called Sodom, which tells us that it's a wicked place, but it is also called Egypt. And there's a very important clue here, because Egypt was not a city. Egypt was a nation. And this place here is called Egypt. It's a city that is a nation. 
And what else do we know about Egypt? It was a land of idols and foreign gods. And we have seen already in the book of Revelation a lot of echoing of the plagues on Egypt as God has unleashed his wrath against the enemy of his people. Uh, it was also a nation that oppressed God's people and a nation that was ultimately judged by God. The fact that this city is called Egypt, therefore, suggests to us that it's not a literal city, but it's a city in a symbolic or, or perhaps a, a, an extended sense. And many of you I know remember uh, that Brother Phil Roberts used to speak often about this concept, and, and he had a masterful way of explaining it. Uh, you look at the Old Testament, and God made a garden. Who is it that builds cities in the Bible? Men, not God. God builds a garden with a tree of life and a river of life. It is men that build cities. Cities are the characteristic work of the ungodly. As we've noted in the book of Genesis, as Brother Dickey has been leading us through on Sunday mornings, one of the first cities mentioned in the Bible is, confusion of languages, Babel, Babylon. Kind of the archetypical city of man, a place that is known for its pride and its arrogance. Look what we have done. Look what we do. And even to this day, we build big cities for that reason. That's the reason we build buildings that are a 100 stories tall. We're showing off what we can do. And that's what we have here. It's not a particular city. It is the city that represents man's folly and pride and ungodliness all of those qualities kind of wrapped up in man's characteristic expression. Uh, let me suggest to you all that there is, uh, to you also, that there is something else that makes this even clearer. Rome was a city. Rome was not a nation. Rome was a city in Italy. But it was a city that ruled the world in the first century a city whose power encompassed the entire world. And when you understand that, you can begin to understand what John here talks about when he says that this city is where Jesus died, but this city is also like a nation and could be called Egypt in a sense. And I want you to suggest uh, to, to think about another suggestion. There's another clue here. Where their Lord was crucified... We hear the word crucified and we don't think much about it. We think about the torturous death that it was. But the fact is that crucifixion was what the Romans did to people. And so when you hear crucify in the ancient world, you have to think first of Rome. And what was the Roman execution of Jesus? It was executing him because this man claims to be the king of the Jews. And remember, that's the charge that's brought up in his trial. This man says that he is a king. Pilate says, are you a king? And the Jews say, we have no king but Caesar. And it's presented to Pontius Pilate as a man who wishes to usurp the authority of Rome. And Pilate caves in at that. And when the Romans executed Jesus, they were sending a public message that this is what we do to people who challenge our authority. Jesus wasn't killed by accident. He was killed as a rejection of who he was and a rejection of his kingdom among men. And that's what John is talking about here when it says their dead bodies would lie in the street of the great city where their Lord was crucified. That the, the saints would suffer at the hands of the very people, the Romans, the arrogant, idol-worshiping, power-hungry people, that killed Jesus. So it's not a reference to a particular city, but it is a uh, symbolic or metaphorical reference to what that represents. Uh, verse 9, those from the peoples and tribes and tongues and nations. Now remember, that's John's way of talking about unbelievers. He's not just saying people in general, but that's his way of saying unregenerate people. And we're going to see in 1715 that that is exactly the expression that he uses in what can only be a description of the Roman Empire here, 
The waters where the harlot sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. Uh, There was only one city, one nation, uh, as it were, that ruled over all those people in, in John's day, and that was Rome. And they are portrayed here as, of course, evil people. They are the same group that are described in verse 10 as those who dwell on the earth. And that's another one of John's phrases for unbelievers, that their home is in this world, not in heaven. It says there that uh, all these peoples will look at their dead bodies for three and a half days and will not permit their dead bodies to be laid in a tomb which is, of course, another expression of contempt. You don't give somebody a decent burial. In the ancient world, of course, a decent burial in some cultures meant that you could go on to the next life, but not to be buried in the pagan way of thinking meant to be denied access to the other world. And so here they are treating God's people with contempt. Uh, Paul issues a statement, something along those lines in 1 Corinthians 4, we have become like the rubbish of the world, the dregs of all things to this very day. That's the picture that's being painted here, that they are so contemptible and so mistreated that nobody will even allow them a proper burial. And uh, notice the, the parallels here with Psalm 79. Uh, this picture is what is in mind here. O God, the nations have invaded your inheritance. They've defiled your holy temple. Remember, chapter 11 began with a vision of the temple of God, a symbol of God's people being measured off for protection. But yet they're going to be persecuted. They have defiled your holy temple. They have lain Jerusalem in ruins. They have given the dead bodies of your servants for food to the birds of the heavens the flesh of your godly ones to the beasts of the earth. They have poured out their blood like water round about Jerusalem, and there was no one to bury them. This picture of we are being treated with the utmost contempt by our enemies. We have become a reproach to our neighbors, a scoffing and derision to those around us. How long, O Lord? We heard that cry back in chapter 5. How long, O Lord, will you not avenge our blood on the earth? Will you be angry forever? Will your jealousy burn like fire? Pour out your wrath on the nations which do not know you and upon the kingdoms which do not call upon your name, for they have devoured Jacob and laid waste his habitation. That's the picture John is painting here. And he's trying to tell these Christians in the first century, this is what you're going to have to go through. It's going to get worse before it gets better. That there is going to be a point when it seems like all is lost that the, the, the forces of evil have won and the world is going to mock you and, and hold you in contempt and it's not going to look like Jesus has won anything. And they're going to do this for the three and a half days, which is, of course, that three and a half number of the time of hardship and suffering like the three and a half years uh, up in the earlier verses. And not only that, verse 10, those who dwell on the earth, these unbelievers will rejoice over them and celebrate and they will send gifts to one another because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. Uh, We get pictures of this in a couple places in the Old Testament in Judges chapter... Somebody please go to Judges 16 and read verse 23 for us. Somebody else please go to... uh, let's, Let's go to the Psalm 89 passage. Psalm 89.42 But as in the Babylonian destruction of Jerusalem, the enemies of God's people rejoiced. As at the destruction of Samaria, we hear the minor prophets complaining that the Edomites were throwing parties when Samaria fell because the Israelites had been destroyed. What does Judges 16.23 say? Anybody have that passage? Go ahead, Mason. And the lords of the Philistines gathered them together to offer a great sacrifice unto Dagon their God, and they rejoiced. They said, Our God has delivered Samson, our enemy, into our hands. Celebration at the defeat of Samson. 89.42 from Psalms. Go ahead, Joseph. You have exalted the right hand of his adversaries. You have made all his enemies rejoice. You made all his enemies rejoice over his adversaries. We say adversaries in this country, but uh, picking on you there. Um, 
Why is it that they torment? How did they torment these wicked people by simply living and preaching the gospel? This gospel, of course, is not only a message of salvation, it's a message of judgment for those that won't listen. You only have to read as far into the New Testament as Matthew chapter 3 to hear John the Baptist saying that the axe is laid at the root of the trees and every tree that does not bear fruit, he will cut it down. That the messianic age is going to be a time of salvation and destruction of the, of the wicked. And that is exactly the way the gospel is. It is repent or die. And these people don't want to hear it anymore. They've been vexed by that message. They don't want to change. And so they're glad to hear that these people who have been preaching this message and condemning their lifestyle are now gone. But after the three and a half days, verse 11, the breath of life from God came into them. They lived again. And of course, there are a couple of things that might come to mind. First of all, the resurrection of Jesus, just as Jesus was in the tomb for about three days and came to life. So after the three and a half days, these ones come to life. Having suffered like their master, they then share in the life of their master. Also, however, in the background is Ezekiel 37, the vision of the valley of dry bones where God's people have been wiped out and there's nothing but the, the dry bones of of dead Israelites there. And Isaiah, or excuse me, Ezekiel speaks the word of God to them. The spirit of God comes into them and those dry bones become people and they live again. Speaking of God's ability to rescue his people out of that situation. And uh, we might also think here of maybe the creation story where that which is dead comes to life because the breath of life is put into it. That God recreates and reconstitutes his people. All of that is in the picture here that by the power of God, he makes them live. Their enemies cannot defeat them. Even if you kill these people, God will rescue them. And so they came to life and stood on their feet, and great fear fell on all those who were watching them, which we would expect, because they thought, well, we've done all we can do to these people. We've killed them. We're done with them. But now there is a sense that they understand that we can't conquer these people. That the worst that we can do doesn't hurt them because their God will rescue them from death. Uh, Joshua chapter 2 and verse 9 said to them, I know that the Lord has given you the land, this is Rahab speaking, and that the terror of you has fallen on us and that all the inhabitants of the land have melted away before you. That's the sense here as well, that it is obvious that God is with them. And when they can stand through this, the people who are their enemies are afraid of them. And not only that, not only do they come back to life, verse 12, they heard a voice from heaven saying to them, come up here. And then they went up into heaven in the cloud and their enemies watched them. And so there's not only do they come back to life, but they go to heaven, vindicated and exalted over their enemies. Now, of course, you have to think of Elijah, who was taken up to heaven, a faithful servant of God against a wicked people in a time of idolatry, the time of Ahab and Jezebel. But of course, this is not a literal resurrection here, a symbol of victory after their apparent defeat, vindication by God, that God not only brings them back to life, but he raises them over their enemies to the heavens. And even though I haven't put it on the chart, I want you to remember that the Romans believed a certain thing about their dead emperors. Anybody remember what that was? They had gone to heaven to join the gods. And John is saying, no, it's our people that go to heaven, not yours. It is the people of the kingdom of God who are called up to heaven to be in the presence of God, not the wicked. What happens to the wicked, all the enemies can do is, is watch it happen. They stay on the earth, the place that is destined for destruction. seems to me that there's kind of a slap in the face at the emperor cult there. You say that your emperor has gone to heaven. He's now one of the gods to be worshipped. John says, no, it's our people that are taken to heaven. And it is the very opposite here of what we see uh, in other places like 613, uh, where 
Um, the stars of the sky fell to the earth, uh, where that great empire had been brought low, and now these lowly people are brought high. Isn't that what Jesus said? The last shall be first, the first shall be last. The lowly shall be exalted, the exalted shall be humbled. That's what's going on here. And they go there to share, obviously, in the messianic exaltation and reign. Paul said in Ephesians 1 and verse 20 that God raised Jesus up and seated him at the right hand of God in the heavenly places. And then in chapter 2, verse 6 says that he has seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You get a vivid picture of that here, that they are seated with Jesus. Even though their enemies have killed them, the Lord rescues them and exalts them. And so what happens next? After the vindication, typically in the Bible, after God has vindicated his people, he then judges the enemy that tried to kill them. And so in that hour, there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell. 7,000 people were killed in the earthquake. The rest were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. And so we have here this great scene of judgment where finally the enemies are forced to acknowledge that God really is God. And when they come to that point, then the seventh trumpet sounds, and we are sort of taken back to a scene that we've seen twice already. There was a loud voice in heaven saying, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. Now it is obvious who the real God is, and it's not the Roman emperor. And it's obvious whose kingdom is greater. It's not the kingdom of Rome. It's the kingdom of God. The kingdom of men, the kingdom of the earth, has been conquered by the kingdom of God. God has defeated the rival kingdom. Jesus talked in this way all the time while he was on the earth. John 12, 31. Now judgment is upon this world and the ruler of this world will be cast out. His death was going to disarm Satan. And Jesus uh, said to his disciples as they were casting out demons that I saw Satan falling from heaven like lightning. He's being dethroned as it were. My kingdom is invading his kingdom and destroying it. Well, that's exactly the end of the story here, that in the end, there will be no kingdom of Rome, there will be no kingdom of the United States or any other such power. At the end, there will only be the kingdom of God. The 24 elders who sat on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshiped God. So now we're back to the throne scene. The elders that we saw in chapters 4 and 5 gathered around the throne of God in whom we heard about briefly again in chapter 7, now come back to this climactic scene. And they said, verse 17, We give thanks to you, O Lord God, the Almighty. Remember that in the Bible, God is not called Almighty for nothing. It's always in a context of God destroying somebody. And here he has destroyed the enemy, this arrogant, wicked empire. God the Almighty, who are, who were, because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. That doesn't mean that God wasn't reigning before. It means that it is now more obvious than it ever was before. That it is clear now that God is reigning. The nations were enraged. Well, you can't hear that without hearing an echo of Psalm 2. Why are the nations in an uproar and the peoples devising a vain thing, saying, let us cast off his fetters and put his chains off of us? The Lord who sits in the heavens scoffs at them and says, I have anointed, I have appointed my Holy One on Zion. To, you are my son. Today I have begotten you and I've given you a rod of iron to which, uh, with which you will rule the nations. You remember that passage. Well, that's being called into play here. The ultimate fulfillment here uh, being experienced. That the nations were in rebellion, but your wrath came. The time came for the dead to be judged. Dead, not the dead in, the, in physical death, but the unbelievers and the time to reward your bondservants, the prophets, and the saints, and those who fear your name, the small and the great, and to destroy those who destroy the earth. 
And then the last scene, verse 19, the temple of God which is in heaven was opened. And we see inside there is the Ark of the Covenant in his temple, which of course nobody ever really got to see. And there were flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder, earthquake and a great hailstorm. We've seen that imagery before. It's always associated with the power of God. When God came down on Mount Sinai, we had thunder, lightning, and smoke and so forth. Uh, same kind of thing here. That this is a display of God in his power in his temple. Now the last thing I want you to think about uh, in verse 19 is a strange little statement there. The temple of God which in, is in heaven was opened. That would have sounded really strange to Jews and anybody familiar with the Old Testament. Because at no time was the temple of God open. And it didn't matter how much you wanted to see inside, if you weren't the high priest, you couldn't go in there. And that's in contrast to pagan temples. You could walk into a pagan temple any time you wanted to. Walk all the way to the back room, to where the statue of the god is back there. As a matter of fact, you were supposed to do that. Because the Romans put all the trophies of war in those temples and they wanted you to go and see the, the things they had collected from their enemies. But nobody got to go into the Jerusalem temple. And so this is an interesting scene. What does it mean that it's open? Well, it is suggested that it might be that this is an invitation for God's people to join him. Remember in Matthew 27 verse 51, the moment that Jesus died, what happened in the temple? The veil was torn as if God were saying, you can come in now. The thing that kept people out was now opened and, and access to God was possible. But let me suggest to you that this would have meant something else to a Roman reader and to people who lived in the Roman province of Asia Minor. There was a temple in Rome, the temple of Janus, that was closed when Rome was at peace and open when Rome was at war. And the Emperor Augustus bragged about this near the end of his life as he wrote his official uh, deeds. He said, Our ancestor Duanus wanted Janus Quirinius, which is the god who was worshipped in that temple, to be closed when throughout the, the, uh, all the rule of the Roman people, by land and sea, peace had been secured through victory. Notice that, peace through victory. Although before my birth it had been closed twice in all recorded memory from the founding of the city, we had been at war constantly except for two times, Augustus said. The Senate voted three times in my principate that it be closed. Augustus is bragging about how he had brought peace by victory over all of his enemies. Plutarch, who wrote a little bit later, first century, uh, described it this way, Janus has a temple at Rome with double doors, which they call the gates of war. For the temple always stands open in time of war, but it is closed when peace has come. The latter was a difficult matter. It rarely happened, since the realm was always engaged in some war, as its increasing size brought it into collision with the barbarous nations which encompassed it round about. But in the time of Augustus, it was closed, after he had overthrown Mark Antony, before that when Marcus Attilius and Marcus uh, Titus Marilius were consuls, it was closed a short time, then war broke out again at once and it was opened. If you knew anything about the city of Rome and the Roman practice, and you see here the temple of God in heaven was open, and then you see flashes of lightning, sounds and peals of thunder, earthquake, hailstorm, you get the picture that this is God saying, I am at war with these people. That temple no longer exists. Uh, I do believe that its foundations were recently discovered in Rome. Uh, but it does uh, appear on some of the coins. These are some of the coins of Nero's time. You can see the doors are closed. That's Nero's way of bragging that I've accomplished peace in my reign. But God says... You may think you've got peace, but my temple doors are open. Thank you for your good attention. As always, we'll pick up, start the second half of the book next week.